Yes, I think that's that's one of the things that um, often when we're told history, we're only told about um, events. Right. Mm -hmm. And the oral histories help us understand not just the events, but the things surrounding the events, the Mm -hmm. cultural understandings and why people do the things that they do, Mm -hmm. how they do the things that they do, Mm -hmm. and why they were so important to them. Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I geek out about the stories we are passionate about in all different genres, styles, and formats. And we'll give a few recommendations to you, our listeners. Beware, possible spoilers ahead. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and I started this podcast during the COVID-19 pandemic. As I watched the reaction of my social media circle, I noticed that many people turned to stories for comfort and help in making sense of the craziness going on around them. And as all good stories do, the world got even crazier. But, as Neil Gaiman says, fairy tales are more than true not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Since I believe that stories have the power to show us the way and give us courage to keep going, I wanted to see if that was true for my guests as well. Hello, listeners. I don't usually do the introductions to my own podcast, but this episode was very profound for me. As I was editing this episode... I remembered something that Ryan Coogler, the director of Black Panther, said when Chadwick Boseman died. He was reciting an African proverb that went something like this. When a person dies, a library burns to the ground. And I realized that Beth, Sessie, and Jenny are doing the exact same thing that I'm doing. They are preserving people's stories. Now, I thought that when I started Story Power, it was just going to be about how people loved stories. They were going to tell the ones that they loved the most. But as the months have gone by, I'm almost at my year mark, the people have been sharing not only the stories they love, but little bits about their lives and the things that they have learned from the stories how their perceptions have changed, and it has enriched my life so much. And I hope it is enriching the lives of those of you who listen every week. So thank you, Beth and Ceci, for helping me realize that everyone's story is important, even if they don't seem to be a very prominent person. So thank you, Beth and Ceci, for that realization. I appreciated and loved our conversation today. And please excuse the thumping noise. There was some sort of audio malfunction, but I hope you'll excuse that and enjoy the episode. Today, I'm at, I am recording episode 24, and I am talking with Beth Henson and Cece Lewis. And they are part of the Douglas Oral History Project. You have one other person that you work with. Can you tell me who that is? Um, The other person is Jeannie Jordan. Jeannie Jordan, yes, because she's in the picture that you sent me. So I wanted wanted to give credit to her. So I had never heard of this project until I was fishing around for guests at the college and someone told me about you. And so I was so fascinated to hear about your project. Can you tell one of you tell or both of you tell a little bit about what you do? I defer to you, Beth. Go right ahead. <laughs> okay, dear. <laughs> well, we started in October of last year. When, because I'm a historian and I'm very interested in Douglas, I was looking for a project involving Douglas for a number of years. My dear friend Jeannie Jordan and I had done some work together in the past. And one week I realized that each of us was going out and interviewing someone that week. 
and I thought, well, why aren't we doing oral histories? That would be a really perfect project to capture Douglas. And so we both thought about Sassy because Sassy had done a tremendous amount of oral history work in Douglas some five years ago. And so we invited her. We took a couple of months working out a mission statement, working out a protocol, figuring out exactly what we were going to focus on. Jeannie was talking to the mayor of Douglas one day, and he offered us an office. So we have an office in the government building, a half a block from the Gadsden. And we opened the door so that we we got into our office beginning of January. And in the beginning of March, we began actually recording interviews. And we've done, I don't know, Ceci, maybe 10 interviews so far. We've been doing one a week. We do them on Wednesdays. We're all there. We record them on a video camera. We are planning to both transcribe them in in their entirety and do little video edits so we have short clips. This is the technical stuff where I am now drowning because um, <laughs> but that's what that's who we are and what we do. That's a great story. So I was wondering if there are that you're linked with other projects, some other similar projects around the country, or is this just a standalone project? Ceci, do you want to answer that one? Yes, Lucinda. Currently, it's a standalone project, and it's just a passion of ours. So Ginny is really, she is Miss Douglas. She loves Douglas, Arizona. She was born there, lived all of her, well, a lot of her life there, and has returned twice. I am born and raised in Douglas, and um, I come from it from a different perspective, wondering why people love Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> and Beth comes from the third perspective of always wanting to have, uh, of, of wanting to know more about the place mm-hmm. and what yeah. it was like. So we're, it's just our personal passions that we're coming to this project with. And currently we are standalone. We're not affiliated with anybody else, Mm -hmm. but we have been receiving a great deal of support, both from the community and from the local officials. And English has been quite supportive and has visited our our little room, (laughs) which is centrally located. You know, it's right there on 10th and G Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's in the heart of Douglas. That's great. Yes. Well, I think oral histories are so fantastic because we have so many different people from all over the world who now come and live here. And so it's one of the ways maybe that we can find commonality. But uh, I, when I was teaching high school in Douglas, I just, I found it to be a really fascinating little community too. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to have you tell about your project. And I was wondering, so far, are there any stories that stand out? We've had several stories that have um, stood out. Yesterday, we interviewed a young young man, a fellow who, um, (laughs) Douglasite, who just broke down. And um, and it was so powerful for him because he's fairly non-emotional from what I understand. And he it really um, brought to the forefront a lot of the ideas. I think one of the main main things is that we're seeing a lot of people reconcile their past with their present as mm-hmm. they're telling these stories. Mm-hmm. And um, to be able to witness that and listen, that is just incredibly it's a gift. It's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful gift. Oh, that's great. Most people start out by saying, I never did anything. I don't have anything. Why would you want to talk to me? Mm-hmm. But when we get when they get started, they have all kinds of they've done all kinds of things. And so it's interesting to see people sort of own up to what they've done. As have their families. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something that's very important to us also that we get to witness is that their their understanding 
um, some of the hardships, but then some of the joys that their families experienced as they were growing and living in Douglas. It, it's really phenomenal to watch that to, to that awareness happening as they're talking to us. Probably one of the most fun shows that I watch on PBS is finding your roots. So I'm thinking there must be some of that kind of thing going on in your, the people when they're telling stories, telling stories about their family history too, not just their lives, but their family histories. Well, I was so fascinated when I was teaching there to find out that Douglas is the airport that is the first international airport in the whole entire country. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's fascinating. And so there must be other fascinating little tidbits that you've picked up about Douglas, listening to people's yes. stories. Do you want to tell about those? Yes, we did an interview with Dan Bourbon and his grandfather, uh, great-grandfather, my great-grandfather also, he's my cousin, um, talked to him about shooting at the during the Mexican Revolution at Pancho Villa and his troops as he stood on the roof of his El Volcan, which was a store on First Street, mm-hmm. First and D. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, having him tell the story as it was told to him and seeing the bullet shot, the bullet holes that his grandfather showed him in the chimney was, you know, <laughs> really fascinating. Yes, <laughs> wow. And that was actually because I was interviewing Joe Moran. Back in October, when I first thought about doing this project, and he was telling me, I had written an article for the Cochise County Historical Journal, and Dan Bor- and Joe Moran went to the editor I was working with and said that when he was a child, he watched his neighbors go under the floorboards in the kitchen and pull out a collection of bullets that were used that would have been used in the revolution. Oh, oh which, yes. And it turned out that in Douglas at that time, many houses were built of adobe and the adobe was, ex- was excavated from the building lot. And then the house was built on that excavation. So many, many of the first homes had little, they weren't full basements. You couldn't stand up in them, Mm -hmm. but they were crawl spaces that people used commonly for storage. And so Joe Moran had been, I don't know, 10 years old and watching people, they were remodeling the kitchen and they got around to taking up the floorboards and finding metal boxes of ammunition. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's interesting. We are also, listen, that we are also finding uh, a lot about that pretty vibrant neighborhood of international and first. Mm-hmm. So um, as we begin interview, we began interviewing people, other people came up like uh, Mr. Rivera, who's researching his great great grandfather from international who built coffins and Mm -hmm. he has photos and so it's just um I don't know it's just wonderful (laughs) especially to be doing it this year Yes. yes oh yes well and Douglas is I I don't know it must be one of the oldest cities in the state so there must be a lot of really great history. Sierra Vista is young compared to Douglas. So that is, that is old as Tombstone or Bisbee, or even Benson for that matter. Mm-hmm. 1901. It was created in 1901. Oh, okay. But still. The smelters, right. Right. Yeah. But still, that's that's pretty good <laughs> compared to. Sierra Vista, which is what, 50 years old or something? (laughs) Well, it's a little over 50 years old, I guess. Yeah, I'm older than that, you know, than I'm older than the city I live in. Yeah, right. Right, yeah. Um, Of course, the fort has been there quite a while. But so, yeah, I would think that there would be all kinds of cities around the country that would have that rich 
history. And I'm excited for your project to keep developing. And then what are you going to do with all of the transcripts and the videos? And do you know what you're going to do with all of that? All those stories? Well, we want to make them available to the general public, oh. particularly because there are so many who are trying to find their roots. Right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Douglas, being from Douglas or being a Douglasite is mm-hmm. a state of mind. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we call it the Douglas diaspora because when the, the smelter shut down, a lot of people had to leave, but they still keep this idea of being from Douglas. Mm-hmm. And there are several Facebook pages about Douglas history and if you grew up in Douglas and um, several things like that. So mm-hmm. we would like this to be a place for people to come and learn and know about or access information about their family. Yeah. Do you have a a museum in Douglas? I can't remember if there's a museum there. Yeah. Douglas has the Douglas Williams House. Oh, which is run by the Douglas Historical Society. It was the home of um, Jimmy Douglas, who was the mine owner, smelter owner, and then it was the home of the mayor. It's a typical small town museum featuring the beautiful dining room and the beautiful gowns. And um, but there is not a lot of workers history available in that museum. Right. And so that's and part of your goal? The history of the local workers is what has been left out of the official history of Douglas. And that is what we are concentrating on. Yes. This is Ceci. That there has not been room in that home, in that museum, to house the stories of the people of Douglas. Yes. It houses, it houses the story, the history of the industry of Douglas at the when it was founded. Mm-hmm. It houses the history of selected uh, business professionals in Douglas, but not the common people. And that's what your project is about. Right. And so when I was doing my doctoral work for my dissertation, I did the histories of 15 women of uh, Mexican heritage who grew up in, mm-hmm. who either moved to Douglas were born in Douglas or moved there as children and and stayed. And when we presented, I had a traveling exhibit mm-hmm. where we presented the information at the Douglas Williams house and specifically asked people to walk through the front door to see it because during James Douglas's residence in that home, Mexican-Americans were not allowed through the front door. Oh. So, yeah. And that's not been that long ago. So um, we know now that the women, the the panels from my dissertation work, have a home there at Penn Street. You can come see them. (laughs) And the Douglas Oral History Project room, and they're on the wall, and they have a permanent home. Oh, that's great. Prior to that, they had to travel. Oh, wow. Those are, that is what you see behind us. Uh-huh. In the photo we sent you yesterday, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there are 15 of them. Oh, wow. Cool. Sassy and Janie's mothers, for example. Oh, oh my mother's not there, but my grandmother. Oh, but you're, you, two of your relatives, no? Mm-hmm. Yeah, your grandmother, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really hard for me to understand why why we feel like we have to exclude um, when I was doing research for the novel that I wrote, the Chinese came to this country. They did all this work on the railroad, but they were not allowed to become citizens. Right. And so it sounds sort of similar to the, you know, Mexican-Americans were not treated like full citizens. I guess I didn't think of that. I should have thought of that before, but that's really sad. Well, whether it's a purposeful exclusion or if it's an issue of just not honoring or recognizing uh, their efforts yeah. is not for us to say. 
But right. what we do want to do with this project is to be able to get people's stories out. I mean, as they be, as they tell them to us, as they start looking for their pictures, as they start telling mm-hmm. their stories, they find out that they learn a whole lot more themselves just by by participating in this project with us. Yes. Well, and one of the reasons I do this podcast is because I love listening to people tell their stories. What made you love stories? How did you become a writer or whatever it is that I'm talking to people about? And uh, it's, I find just the ordinary person's stories fascinating because their experiences are so varied. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to tell anything about your backgrounds a little bit? I've been in Bisbee since 1983. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a whole variety of jobs there. I worked at the co-op for many, many years. I worked for an environmentalist. Uh, I lived in Mexico a lot. I lived in Zacatecas. I lived in Chihuahua. When I was about 50, I decided I would finally go, go back to school. I got my undergrad, master's degree, and PhD at the University of Arizona in the history department. It took me a long time, but I wrote a book. And it was when I was finishing the book that I started looking around for another project, because my degrees in Latin American history, which essentially at U of A can be nothing but Mexican history, So I wrote a book about Chihuahua, which is kind of my second home, but I needed a project closer to home. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started going to Douglas a lot and working with Jeannie. That's cool. So what's the name of your book? Agrarian Revolt in the Sierra of Chihuahua. Ah, It's about an armed protest movement in the 1960s in Chihuahua. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And was that your dissertation? That was my dissertation. It was also my master's degree. Oh, wow. I spent 12 years on that book. Oh, my goodness. The research. Yeah. Wow. And Ceci, tell a little bit about yourself. (laughs) Are you, you will be editing this, right, Lucinda? Yeah, yes, I will. <laughs> uh, are, I wanted to know, though, are you still teaching part-time at the college or are you fully retired? Now? I'm fully retired. So um, I was born and raised in Douglas, mm-hmm. as I mentioned. And my very first job ever was uh, as an EKG tech at the Douglas Hospital on 9th and Neff Avenue. Oh, wow. Which closed in 1974. I left right before it closed, but so I had very, because they trained me to do EKG, various and jobs mm-hmm. in the medical field. And I did that for 21 years, not because necessarily I was passionate about working in the medical fields, but because it was what I could do. Mm-hmm. And um, I realized that it's not necessarily what I wanted to do. It was just what I could. So I went back to school. In my 30s, because I wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I started at Cochise College here in Sierra Vista and got an associate in general studies with an emphasis on education and went to U of A and earned my bachelor's in secondary ed. I extended English so Mm -hmm. I could teach drama, journalism, Mm -hmm. and speech. And I started teaching first at Bisbee. I did a year in Bisbee, five year, four years at Buena, and eight years at Tombstone before I shifted to the college. Mm-hmm. At mm-hmm. Um, I earned my bachelor, my master's degree at Middlebury College at the Breadloaf School of English, which has been a phenomenal experience for me because I have worked with teachers all over the world. And so, and I have presented with teachers all over the world and done workshops in Nairobi and Mumbai and uh, Port-au-Prince. I've been very fortunate in my 
academic experience. And I heard at Breadloaf from a professor, Damian Baca, that they were starting a Mexican American studies program, PhD program at U of A. And I was all about that. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd already been collecting the stories of my mother's family. Mm-hmm. And so I applied at the ripe old age of like 58 or 59. And I applied, I was accepted to the inaugural cohort. And that's where I did my dissertation work on women of Douglas of Mexican heritage. And I graduated in 2016. Wow, that's so fascinating. I retired from Cochise this last year, 2020. Yay! Yay! <laughs> yes, when we all had to teach via Zoom. <laughs> yes, you know, I had, I had, well, you know, it was interesting, Lucinda, because I, um, I retired in the midst of the pandemic. So mm-hmm. I ended my teaching career with no students, right? I mean, mm-hmm. virtual students. Mm-hmm. which was very difficult for me. But it was, you know, just how it was. Yep, that's right. Teaching acting via Zoom is pretty interesting. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can <laughs> only imagine. <laughs> it's very interesting. But next fall, we are going back to face-to-face. So that's good. Yeah, I totally understand both of you saying you kind of didn't know what you wanted to do when you grew up until you were older, because that's what happened to me. I was teaching English and Douglas, even though my education is in theater. And I, one day I realized, oh, I want to be a writer, which then led to my book, but then it led to my podcast, I mean, my blog, and then my podcast. So it's like, oh, now that I'm in my late 60s, I'm kind of finally figuring out what I want to do with my life. Uh, So uh, I applaud both of you going back to school when you're older, because it's harder than. No, it's easier than. It is. I I worked for -for not-for-profit organizations for much of my life, Mm -hmm. and that was hard. Oh, My last job 14 months in Chihuahua City, working with an NGO that worked with the Taramara in the Sierra with a half a million dollar a year budget, which I was one of the people who had to raise, and a political prisoner. We had to get out of jail. Mm. And there was no blueprint. Most of the things I've done in life were really, really hard. When I went back to school, it was, yes, they give me something to do. They help me if I have a problem. (laughs) I do it. They give me the next thing to do. (laughs) You know, and I had all kinds of experience. I mean, I felt bad because I was competing with people who were 30 years younger than I was. But I I could write about things I'd actually done in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of my major writing projects came off of something I'd been involved with in one way or another. Well, that's great for you. Yeah. I already knew how to study. That's right. Yes. You know, I spent my whole life studying one thing or another. Well, for me, I was teaching full time and getting my master's of education. I already had my master's in theater and teaching full time, directing plays and going to school full time. And that was difficult. I I was uh, every single minute of every day was taken up with something. I didn't have any downtime at all for almost two years. So to me, that was difficult. But yes, I totally understand. It's easier to handle when you're a little bit older, the stresses. Did you find that too, Sassy? Well, I was raising children who were 10 years apart in age. Oh, wow. So when I was doing my undergraduate work, we had a four-year-old and a 14-year-old. Oh, and, wow. um, you know, working side uh, part-time jobs and going to school full-time. It was challenging, very challenging. Same thing with, you know, with the bachelor, uh, the PH, the master's and the PhD. I yeah. was fortunate, though, that uh, I was able to take a sabbatical, thank God, for Cochise College and offering mm-hmm. that opportunity. Yes. Uh, my 
dissertation committee kept saying, why are you in such a hurry? Why do you have to get this done? Like now? And I said, cause I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> don't have the luxury of time. We got to get this done. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> That's funny. They didn't see you as old, I guess. Well, maybe not. But, you know, Lucinda, I think that one of the things that Beth said really, really underscores the work that we're doing is that we value, we truly value in in the Douglas Oral History Project life experiences. Yes. And that's why our stories, why capturing these stories is so important to us. It's uh, the life experiences that really give us a better understanding and depth to what the history can bring to us and the richness of the community Mm -hmm. yes because I've I don't know I went from teaching at Buena to teaching at the high school in Douglas and well first I taught at the middle school that was like I practically died didn't ever want to teach seventh grade again Uh, but 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 teaching at the high school and it was such a different experience teaching in Douglas than it was at Buena. And one was not, I, won't, I don't want to say that it was bad teaching at Buena because I got to teach all those theater classes, but the attitude of the parents was different. That, yes. was, that was wonderful to feel like the, the parents supported the teachers. And I didn't really feel that way when I was teaching in Boina, at Boina. So that was really great. So I was, oh, what a nice place to, to work. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> yes, I think that's, that's one of the things that um, often when we're told history, we're only told about um, events. Right. Mm-hmm. And the oral histories help us understand not just the events, but the things surrounding the events, the mm-hmm. cultural understandings and why people do the things that they do, mm-hmm. how they do the things that they do, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and why they were so important to them. Uh, to me, it is important to go back and look at history uh, and try to understand how things happened so that when I'm looking at what's happening now, I can go, I can look back a few years and say, oh, this is how we got to where we are now. Mm-hmm. Um, but history helps me go, oh, well, I don't want to go that to that place. And so, I don't know. I just think that we can learn from history if we pay attention to how it relates to now. Do you have anything else you want to say at the end here? Beth, have you got any last thoughts you want to say? It's it's wonderful to have something this wonderful to do this year. Yes. And it's lovely to work with Jeannie and Sassy. I agree. I think that we have hit the gold mine when it comes to <laughs> because although we have kind of different interests, mm-hmm. we're still the same, you know, and um and and that's what is so wonderful. It's just it mm-hmm. truly is a work of love. Well, and when you hear people's stories, that sort of adds to your, I don't know, to your spirit, maybe. Um, that's how I feel when I'm talking to people on the podcast. It's like, oh, I gain something from that, from hearing their stories. It, it truly nurtures my humanity. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Of course. It makes me feel connected. Of mm-hmm. course. Oh, wow. That's so great. Well, I hope that in the future, of course, you're probably not thinking about that quite yet since it's fairly new, but that you have an actual dedicated space where you can have the videos available and the transcripts available and pictures of people and the places that they lived and worked. That would be really interesting and cool for you to have like your own museum his like oral history museum or something might not ever (laughs) you're working on it yes as a matter of fact we do hope to have um an exhibit Mm -hmm. in the um municipal building for labor day oh to honor the laborers 
Oh, yeah. So, uh, uh, Douglas in the beginning, the first half of the 20th century. So, yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, cool. Do you have an editor, somebody who can edit your videos for you? That would you be you, Beth. Oh, yes. Oh, we are learning. <laughs> We're yes. learning. Yes. We're learning. Long curve, a huge curve. You learning. have a long curve to learn how to use it. Listen to what editing program do you use? Well, my husband is the one who does the video editing. I had to teach myself how to use, because he's a graphic artist and he's a Mac geek and he loves all that. So he uses iMovie, but I had to teach myself how to use GarageBand to record these and edit these. And then I, I, when I first started, which was a year ago, July, July 22nd was my first episode last year. I didn't have any music with it. So at Christmas time, I got Barry to help me figure out the, there are little, little segments of songs. And so he helped me learn how to use that. And then I put together some like little music to go along with my podcast to like for the introduction that's as far as I've gotten so far. I don't really, I'm sure that there are better settings for getting rid of static and so on and so forth, but that's how far I am. I always videotape my acting students. And if I need to edit something, I always go, Barry, can you help me with this? So he helps me, you know, edit it down a little bit, but I don't really know how to use the video editing. I always have to rely on my techie husband. Yeah. Neither do we. (laughs) (laughs) But it's okay. But we don't even know how to use the cameras and (laughs) (laughs) the microphones and the (laughs) Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. We're pretty confident. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Well, and you know, we were talking about you going back to school, and that is one thing. I I love having something new to learn even if I'm not going to school to learn it, it is fun to have something new to learn to do. So it uh, keeps me young. Well, My- you sound like Beth. That's not me. I like to already know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> I have to learn something new that doesn't involve a computer. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. Yes. I am not a computer native or a technology native. I am a technology immigrant. I heard that once in some class that I took and I said, oh yeah, that's me. I'm a technology immigrant. <laughs> but, well, thank you for including us in your blog. This is, this is nice. In your yes. Podcast. Yeah. Podcast. That's the word. That's I have several people that are from the college. Some of them are my students and some people work there. And so it was nice to have that connection with you, Sassy, because you work at the college. Um, and, but when I found out about the project, I said, oh, wow. And then when I was looking at your Facebook page, I saw a lot of different communities that have similar projects. And I said, well, that's really cool because my husband used to be involved in the empty bowls project, um, when he was working at the city pottery studio And there are lots and lots and lots of communities around the country that do that. And then they're all sort of related to each other. So I was wondering if you guys were, had like an organization that um, you belonged to, but hey, maybe sometime in the future that will happen and you'll be able to connect up. Because I think it would be fun if people in other parts of the country got to hear the stories of the people in Douglas. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being my guests. I appreciate you sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. You'll find the show notes for this episode at my website, Sage Woman Chronicles at sagewoman.life. 
you can leave a comment there. And remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.